On this final episode of the Young Pioneer Podcast Season 2, we've got another two-part episode. First, we'll have a North Korea travel update with YPT co-founder Gareth Johnson, recorded on our recent research trip to China. This will be followed by a discussion with YPT's longtime travel partner and friend, Dr. Calvin Sun, about his book, Monsoon Diaries, a doctor's journey of hope and healing from the ER front lines to the far reaches and more. Plus, we'll talk about some new and exciting tours coming up this summer and fall. I'm Justin Martell, and we've got all this and more on this Season 2 finale of the Young Pioneer Podcast. Okay, we know it's been some time since we've published a YPT podcast, but if you've been following us, we have a good excuse as international tours are in full swing with both classic and brand new tours alike. I've personally just returned from co-guiding our 2024 Horn of Africa tour with Rowan Beard, where our group visited Djibouti, Somaliland, Eritrea, and Mogadishu, while the rest of our staff are all across the globe leading our customers through some of the world's most exciting, fascinating, and hard to read destinations. Anyway, let's get into the million dollar question. When is North Korea going to reopen? We are asked this question dozens of times daily on our social media and via email. And if you've been following our social media, you'll have seen that we recently visited China to meet with our North Korean and Chinese travel partners to discuss the DPRK's reopening to Western tourists. And our partners indicated that an opening during the second half of this year seemed possible. I want to emphasize, though, that it seems possible. And remember that this is North Korea and there's always an element of unpredictability when it comes to the Hermit Kingdom. While we were in China, we took the opportunity to get a look at the DPRK from the Sino-North Korean border and visited Dandong, Yanji, and Tumen. So let's get into the first part of this podcast, my discussion with YPT founder and CEO Gareth Johnson recorded over a few glasses of soju in Yanji, the seat of China's Yanbian Korean Autonomous Prefecture. Okay, so to kick off this two-part episode of, uh, I think this is probably going to be the, actually the final episode of season two of the Young Pioneer podcast. We're coming on uh, season three time, and uh, we use, as you know, we do like to do two-part interviews. Oh, excuse me, we're having a we. This is actually uh, a good time to introduce where we are. We're actually sitting uh, in a restaurant in Yanji, which is in uh, Yanbian, the Korean Autonomous Prefecture here in Northeast China. I'm sitting across the table from Mr. Gareth Johnson, CEO of YPT. Behind him, I'm staring at a very nice painting of Mount Pictou. So I think that should give you a good idea of the setting. Um, over the last few days, uh, we have had a series of meetings um, from Beijing to Dandong to Yanji to Tumen with our various Korean partners and contacts discussing the big question. And we all know what the big question is. When is North Korea going to reopen for tourism? Um, so why don't we just back up a little bit, Gareth, and let's talk about when North Korea closed. Let's talk about... Let's even let's let's go back a little further. I want to go back to when uh, Ebola there was a Ebola outbreak. Um, I believe not anywhere close to Asia at the time, right? Yeah, North Korea uh, initially they um, they didn't close. Initially they said anyone that had been to Africa, anyone from various countries, couldn't come in the country. And then about a week later, abruptly uh, closed their doors and. They closed for five months. I mean, for us as a very young company at the time, it was it was really, really tough. Um, but in some respects, it gave us a little bit of foresight. So when the DPRK closed due to COVID, we we kind of knew what was coming. Although, well, let's well let's back up. So we were doing uh, international tours at that time. 
but I think still about 80% of the business was mm. North Korea tours. Absolutely. So I think Ebola was kind of where um, you first saw the writing, writing on the wall that this could happen again mm. and it could potentially happen for longer. And of course it did. So take us there now. Yes, so I mean, uh, we, North Korea is still our love. It's, it's our number one place. It's, you know, sort of our entry place for people. But following what happened with Ebola, we, we, we seriously wanted to expand where we did business. I mean, you know, no business is good if you're too reliant on one place. So over the years, we've, we've continually expanded. And then, you know, when this happened, we, we, we expedited, expedited that even further. So we're, we're now, you know, we're not completely immune, but we, we can survive if North Korea closes. And that actually puts us in a real strong position. We've carried on. We've still got guides. We've still got everything ready to pump when North Korea reopens. And when did North Korea close officially? It was, um, I, think, I believe it was January the 22nd of 2020 so I don't know if any many of you remember the, the dark days of COVID um, China closed its borders with Hong Kong or Hong Kong closed the borders um, mid-February um, and then it was sort of like March, April May even when the whole world started to shut down so North Korea were, were the first I think many of the Pacific Islands followed it which we, we're very much used to the Pacific Islands as well and sadly I, I got it right on this one because when North Korea closed they were the first to close and I said they would be the last to reopen and that's uh, sadly become the absolute case. There are actually two countries in the world where the population is not vaccinated. Now of course we don't want to get into a debate about the effectiveness of vaccines or whatever but we're just, just saying as a general in a general sense there are two countries in the world where the population are not vaccinated. Those are North Korea and Eritrea, also known as the North Korea of Africa. Some people would say that. The point I'm trying to make, and the reason I bring that up, is not to uh, have a go at North Korea for not having vaccinated their population or criticize them in any way, shape, or form. I think it just adds a little bit more backdrop as to why they're so cautious as to reopen. We also have another thing. There haven't been foreigners in the country for four years. Is it possible that foreigners coming in just with not even COVID-19, but the flu, the common cold, um, you know, could that also affect people? And is that something you think the authorities might be taking into consideration? I think the authorities are taking everything into consideration. Um, and obviously, you know, they, they do worry about their people. They don't want people to get sick. Um, I think it's... This will also have a heavy impact on exactly when things reopen. Like, we're up on the border now. It's not freezing cold, but it's still cold. It's, there's still rain. You're wearing jackets when you go out. So, as we know, the cold helps spread germs. So, I think, you know, when the weather's great in the uh, yeah, summer... Oh, how many houses in the night? Oh, how many houses in the night? Oh, how many houses in the what is your there? Was some, some sort of che think, cheesy uh, corn, it looks cheesy like. Cheesy corn? We just got a cheesy corn dish. That looks really good. Let's try it. It's right up your alley. I will I will. It's literally it. cheese and corn. <laughs> oh. All right. We are not reinventing the wheel. This is <laughs> cheese with corn. I'm taking a picture of this. With soju. With soju. This makes us happy. Okay, so I'm actually, gonna... actually refill your glass because let's 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 do a cheers. Yeah, yeah. Let's do a little soju cheers. So because it's 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 been quite the trip. We've been again up and down from Beijing and then up and down northeast China, um, just kind of getting a feel for you know how things are and the, the lay of the land and just just how things look in terms of reopening. And um, we think things look good. So to that, I say to you, chupe, 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 and danseme. Danseme. Okay, so do we want to talk about our first meeting? Yes, yeah, so the first meeting we had was with our partners in Beijing um, about the big question, about lots of different things, you know, procedure, how we're going to do things in the future. But the big question was and is when will North Korea reopen? 
So we put a lot of this online. I wrote a large piece about this, which got some flack back from certain... Yes, I understand that you've caused a little bit of controversy. Yes, Sam. What we said from our meeting was that the North Koreans have indicated to us that the country will reopen in the second half of the year. That is what they're being told. That's what's being indicated. Of course, this does not mean it will definitely happen. We're in China talking to the Koreans, getting updates, and they believe the second half of the year. It could happen sooner. It could happen later. But it's looking pretty sure that they will reopen. You know, we'll talk about it in a bit, but there's already people going in. And we're confident we're going to be some of them as well this year. And, and I want to stress an important point because we have had contact with um, our North Korean partners, also some of our partners on the Chinese side. And basically, you know, over the last four years, everyone's just said, we have no idea. This was the first time we actually sat down with North Koreans and they basically said definitely this year. And then probably the second half. So, I mean, there was a fairly definitive answer given that it was going to happen yeah. sometime this year. And that is the first time we've received such, such an answer. And that is why it's significant. Yes. I mean, I mean, the other thing with it as well is, you know, all through COVID and since, you know, the end and coming out of it, we have stayed a full time travel agency. We have stayed on the ball, doing business, taking people around the world. We are always in contact with the Koreans. We're always in contact with our partners. We've not just gone part time on this, you know? So basically, we wouldn't be announcing this if we didn't think it had some legs. But of course, we're aware it's, it's DPRK. Things may well change. But with all the evidence in front of us, Things are looking good for opening this year, and there's there's no there's no other way to put it. It's it's interesting because it's kind of you know, kind of like doing detective work, you know, working on this particular issue, because we received that piece of information in Beijing. Yes, definitely this year, probably the second half of the year. Then we traveled to Dandong, and uh, we met with our, our local partner. Actually, is a Chinese on the Chinese side, um, and. It's funny. He said, uh, "He said, well, I thought you were coming to Dandong because you had good you, yeah. good news for me." And we said, "Well, we do have good news for you." But he shared with us another piece of information that the North Koreans in Beijing didn't seem to have. And I'll let you elaborate on that. Yeah. So our North Koreans in Beijing, they deal with Western groups. They deal with the big tourist groups that, that come to Pyongyang and beyond. Um, but our partners in Dandong. Great guys help us get from Dandong to Sinuiju and all that kind of jazz. But they specialize in taking Chinese on the day trips and the overnight trips. Now, you know, people call North to, to, to Sinuiju. Sorry. So Sinuiju is the border town between Dandong and China. We also run trips here. And it looks like we might be running some soon. Um, but it's kind of like North Korea light. People go there to stay in the hotel, see the singing and dancing. It's a very cool place. But our partners there specifically deal with Chinese going to Sinuiju. Um, now, again, interestingly, when people say, you know, hardly anyone goes to North Korea, you know, there are Chinese doing these day trips and overnight trips every year. So this is, uh, this is big business and it exists in a very separate bubble to the KITC, Pyongyang tourism that you, you'll see with the, uh, the Western groups there. So basically, and this is something we suspected, this is something we hypothesized about, but again, it's just an opinion. Tsinyuiju will open before Pyongyang. And, you know, for many years now, there used to be foreigners, couldn't, Westerners couldn't go there in the past. That has now been removed. But when they reopen, as far as we are aware, it is planned that both Westerners and Chinese will be able to go to Sinuiju on the day trips and the overnight trips. Um, and we've discussed it with our partners. We will be running these trips when it opens. So if you really need a DPRK fix in your arm, we've got you covered. But just to clarify exactly what you're saying, it's looking like for large groups, Sinuiju will open before Pyongyang does. It's almost quarantine light. It restricts the movement of foreigners uh, within the country, keeps them right on the border uh, to, you know, I guess 
potentially safeguard against a COVID outbreak, right? I think, uh, is that the idea, you think? Oh, abs- absolutely. So, I mean, there's been plans for various different islands and tourist zones, but Sinuju is going to be a special economic region at one point um, before the Dutch-Korean man went on holiday, I believe. Um, but basically, Sinuju, the tours that happen in Sinuju with the Chinese already exist in a quarantine-like bubble. It's a special hotel that was built by CITS, the China International Travel Service, um, and it caters to these Chinese groups. So everybody working there is part of the tourist industry. So it would be very easy to open this and essentially see how it goes before doing a big, wider opening of Pyongyang. Again, part of this is what we've been told by our Chinese and Korean partners, but part of this is hypothesizing based on evidence. But, talking about beyond Sinwiju, it does look like North Korea has allowed some special delegations to travel to both um, Pyongyang and Masik Pass. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I'd love to. I mean, again, this, this moves us to reiterate the point of the fact we are, we went to Beijing to talk directly to our partners. So if you look at this from the outside, you've had sporting people have gone to Pyongyang. Um, the Russian delegation went to went to Pyongyang. Um, and then last month, um, groups of Juche, people that study the Juche idea, the national ideolo- ideology of the DPRK, also came into the country. So this obviously got us to question our colleagues in North Korea, can we go? To which they replied, it's a very different type of visa. So tourism, tourists come in under uh, a tourism visa, delegates come in under a separate visa. Sports people come in under a separate visa. So for now, we cannot arrange tourist visas, but it's obviously an extremely positive side. With regards to the Russians that have gone to the DPRK, they are another exception since um, Mr. Lavrov, the, the foreign minister of Russia, went to the DPRK and they struck a tourism deal. And it's hoped by both parties that um, uh, more Russian tourists will go to North Korea. But as our um, friends put it, this was political and it, an exception rather than a norm. But again, it's if these can exist in these little kind of small pockets, you know, if uh, 100 Russians come in, there's no real issues. Uh, you know, 50 people come in on a Juche study delegation, there's no issues. Then, you know, everything is a test. If they open Sinuiju, there's no issues or few issues. Then, you know, it all leads to, to the eventual place of, of normalization, which is where, where we want to go. And again, this is why we came here to talk to our partners, to really understand what's going on. And that's why our opinion, it counts now. It counts, you know. Because you were saying they've allowed these delegations to come in on a limited basis to test the waters to see how it goes. And there's always the famous saying about North Korea, two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. So we need to also allow and to anticipate for something like that to happen as well. You know, I mean, this is the thing, like I said, it's been this kind of pointless backlash against the same North Korea by open in the second half of the year. The reality is, we, you know, we, we hold our hands up. We know anything can happen. And we spoke to our partners and they kind of confirmed the same. You know, there's a bit of a joke in the company in that North Korea might open tomorrow or it might never open. And that's, you know, it's not it's not that inaccurate. You know, we're, we're ready for any any anything that happens, you know. And there's political things involved now. You know, the world's coming to like a bit of a Cold War 2.0. Maybe they'll just never let Westerners in again. Who knows? But honestly, our partners are confident. We're confident, and that's you know that's why we came and came and chatted to them. And, you know, our, our friends that work in tourism, they really want this to happen, and you know we we want to support our friends there still as well. Absolutely. And um, before we before we wrap this up, I want to do a little just a quick lightning round with you. All right, so North Korea reopens in July. You go back to the country for the first time in four years. All right. Let's assume that every. Let's assume that everything is still in place. All yeah. the tourism structure is still in place. In Pyongyang, what hotel do you want to stay at? Uh, the GAC. And in terms of activities, what would be your first the thing you'd want to do? Three Revolutions exhibition. In terms of food, what would you want to eat? Woof woof. 
<laughs> I think we know what that means. Uh, in terms of cities outside of Pyongyang, what's the first you'd want to visit? One Sun. All right, and I think it's no secret, Gareth, that you like a drink. It's so, no secret that I like a drink. That would be. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna call that. And, and all of us at YPT do as well. So, um, so what's the first drink that you'd have? Uh, your first spirit in first North spirit. Korea. Uh, so I'm gonna throw a bit of a curveball here. Ooh, actually, it's, it, actually, ooh, it's it's a, it's a it's a tie. Whichever one I find first is either Tiger Bone Whiskey or Ginseng Soju. Mmm, remember that one. Both of them, as I understand it, are good for the man. <laughs> and, and on that note, I'm going to say to you, Chupe Datsume. From Yanji. From, from y- the border of the DPRK. And that was my discussion with Gareth Johnson about the DPRK's potential reopening later this year. If you would like to be the first to hear about North Korean travel updates, visit youngpioneertours.com and sign up for our newsletter and mailing list. And you can be sure we will have an update out as soon as we have more to report on North Korea's reopening to Western tourists. For the next part of this podcast, it's my pleasure to share my interview with YPT's longtime friend and travel partner, Dr. Calvin Sun, recorded during our trip to Mogadishu. Calvin is both an ER doctor from New York City and manages the travel company Monsoon Diaries, and he's been partnering with YPT on tours for well over a decade. Recently, he published a memoir chronicling his experiences as an ER doctor during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as his world travels. Do they sound like clashing topics? Let's go to my interview with Calvin for more details. Okay, we're sitting here in the uh, dining room of the Shamo Hotel in Mogadishu. Uh, we've just wrapped up, uh, or actually we're wrapping up YPT's Horn of Africa tour. We've just traveled through Djibouti, Somaliland, Eritrea, and now Somalia proper. Of course, I've gotten a chance to spend some more time with Dr. Calvin's son, who's recently just published a book called The Monsoon Diaries, A Doctor's Journey of Hope and Healing from the ER Frontlines to the Far Reaches of the World. So weaving from past to present, part travelogue, part first-hand account of the hardships faced by hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically in New York City, as well as a journey about overcoming personal grief. Calvin wrote the Monsoon Diaries to share his personal journey with the world to contribute towards building a more empathetic society, both at home and worldwide. Of course, also, the Monsoon Diaries is the name of Calvin's travel company, and YPT and Monsoon Diaries have coordinated many tours together, I think for close to a decade now, right? 2010 of August, no, 2011 of August, so more than a decade, 12 years. So I'm, thank you, Justin, for also the honor of being on your podcast and also having stayed friends with me since our first trip together to Nauru, and now here we are in Mogadishu of Somalia. So we've been through a lot together. I want to thank YPT for also trusting me for all these years in doing these trips together, as well as my publisher, since we're going to be talking about a book. My publisher, Harper Collins, for also taking a chance on a first-time author like myself. And you know, I'm still in disbelief that such huge organizations like YPT and Harper Collins uh, took notice of a dinky little travel blog that I started back in 2010 to, met, to let my mom know that I was doing okay on my solo travels. One of the things I liked about the book, I'll just, I'm just going to jump right into it, and I'll just, I'm letting the I'll let listeners know that, as I mentioned, we're in the dining room, so um, actually we have one group ready, getting ready to head to the airport. We have another group uh, getting ready to do a city tour of Mogadishu. So you're going to hear some things in the background, um, you know, dishes clattering as uh, coffee and omelets are delivered and things of that nature. But anyway, jumping right into it, what I liked was that rather than just like a first-hand account, because you read a lot of uh, sort of autobiographies or memoirs and stuff, and uh, it's just like, well, I went here, I did this, uh, that's right, I did it, I'm the best. But yours is, um, it's kind of more of your inner monologue, so it's very relatable because we're reading as you sort of process various highs, lows, doubts, and other things that you're confident in. And I'm always seeing you, you know, on the tours that we've been on, I'm always seeing you uh, blogging, you know, even as sort of the group's out carrying on and drinking or something, whatever, you're off writing a blog about the day. Um, why did you decide to go with that approach? And I still make it in time to go drinking with y'all. 
You can do both. That's true too. So you you too can uh, can, can uh, imbibe heavily on a YPT tour and also uh, publish a book. Your writings are more honest when you're when you have the liquid confidence of uh, drinking with friends and also you know sometimes you can bring the laptop to drinking and have a drink and write something about uh, what's going on in the moment and and I think the the appeal of Writing while traveling is that it provides this authenticity that I think most travel blogs had lacked when I started the Monsoon Diaries in 2010. A lot of travel blogs at the time wrote after the fact, and the audience already knew they were fine and doing okay. Where a lot of my writing was not with the intent of oh I I want authentic- authenticity. Then you're not authentic, <laughs> you know like. Uh, I'm a modest person. You're not modest. Or I'm someone with no insecurities. You got some issues. <laughs> no, the, the idea was that if I don't write it in the moment, I'm going to forget everything. Because it's kind of like a media dump with all those uh, that, uh, for the, for, um, photographers that they take. They take a million pictures. And then if they don't upload in the moment or review, review it in the moment, it gets really, really hard to wait until the very end of the trip to look back at the thousands of photos you took and go, yeah, I'm going to look through all of them. No, you're just going to put them away, forget about it, and maybe 10 to 20 20 years later someone asks you about it and you're like, ah, man, I wish I uh, reviewed it. So when it comes to travel blogging, I felt the same way where I wanted to review the, what we did during the day in the moment and write everything that happened as close as possible to what we had done so that I wouldn't forget all the fun, little intricate details that make a trip unique and impactful. And I think when somebody reads that, it, they also feel this, this immediacy, that they are right there with me. So bringing the laptop and writing as you're watching me write a blog as we're all drinking is part of the process of hey, I'm right now reflecting on what we did today and we're still in the middle of dinner right now. The next step is who knows what. And anyway, as people read that as, as it's published, they know that the story's not over yet. So it encourages them to keep reading and encourages me to keep writing and staying present, which is ironic because the, the sight of someone on their laptop while we're all drinking isn't really staying present. But I think that uh, striking that balance of writing a laptop, putting it away, and then continuing my drinks with you was the practice of starting to be present and then putting it away. So taking a photo of the beautiful thing, then putting the camera away and spending the next five minutes looking at it and being present. So I think that that balance worked for, worked for me. And I, just so uh, now looking back, I could say that it did work for me because now we have a book out and we're still traveling together. And you don't think I'm a antisocial weirdo that you can relate to because you're interviewing me right now in Mogadishu. Well, I finally saw what you were working on this whole time, <laughs> you know. Was it to surf porn or read the news or, uh, or you know, the, the, that Wi-Fi that we, we asked for is essentially to write down and, you know, share, share with the world so that they feel that they can be traveling with us. And I think when people read that, they're more encouraged to join. And then I became one of the few travel bloggers to say yes when people asked to come along. And now we have this community of travelers with the Monsoon Diaries that it's kind of like Forrest Gump. Everywhere I fly in or travel to, there's always going to be three to four people, up to 40 to 50 now, uh, that want to join on our trips. Great. And so, actually, so let's just back up. Before Monsoon Diaries, before the book, before your experience working in uh, various ERs in New York City during the COVID-19 pandemic, you were born in and you grew up in Manhattan. Can you tell us a little bit more about your upbringing? Born and raised in New York and had a childhood where my parents weren't really around. Raised by, um, I guess, a family of babysitters. It's the best way I can put it. Uh, very grateful for the privilege of growing up in a place like New York, having the access to education that my parents really insisted for me and that actually had people who showed me what love was. But it didn't come from 
a lot of which didn't come from my parents because my dad was in Connecticut working on his business and I only saw him on the weekends if he decided to come down to the city at all. And my mother worked at a motel franchise that my dad got for her in order to keep her busy because she had a hard time raising me for many reasons. So I was lucky to have one or two babysitters that I liked who took really good care of me, but I never felt there was a connection with uh, getting to know myself. And then when I went to school, being a person of color in New York City was pretty difficult. I uh, was bullied a lot, singled out for being different, and just accepted or normalized feeling that I was always the other. That I didn't have a normal family like everyone else spoke about. I'm not saying everyone has a normal family. There's a lot of fucked up families out there, but a lot of people at least put on the image when you're in school that they have a mother and a father and a family with traditions and getting together and having family dinners. I, I didn't have. And also pointed to the fact that I was different from everyone else as a person of color growing up in the 80s and 90s. So that carried me forward to where I everything that I do now is through the lens of someone that never felt like I belonged anywhere and being okay with that or being comfortable with the uncomfortable. And that came to an inflection point when my dad died of a sudden heart attack at the, age, at the age of 60 when I was 19 years old. And I remember that day where we had fought, which raised his blood pressure, which is something that he was very worried about. And then he, the irony was he did an activity to blow off his, uh, his stress and to lower his blood pressure, which caused him the heart attack. He went on a, a treadmill in the New York Sports Club uh, in downtown Manhattan and then uh, the last thing I ever remember was uh, me again in an argument with him and then maybe a weird phone call from him like one of those weird phone calls that you know I wrote about in my book and then uh, then um, a call from the FDNY saying that he was in cardiac arrest so by the time I went to the emergency room where he was he was already gone never got to say goodbye my mom at the time was diagnosed with Parkinson's so that was a really tough summer that night I went home alone my mom couldn't take care of me, couldn't stay with me. She went to live with her parents in Queens. And I remember just going home alone and realizing, this is real life. I can't take anything for granted. And for someone who grew up in New York City, that just became more of a of, of confirmation that already you grew up in New York, everything's chaos. And then now that chaos has become your living everyday personal life that has infiltrated the, your safe space, your home. So going home alone and waking up the next morning alone, going to work right afterwards because I needed some kind of stability and everyone at work found out what happened. Like, what are you doing here? And I said, I have nowhere else to go. And almost dropped out of college because my dad was the only one who could make money uh, for the family. My mom had Parkinson's, she was on disability at this point. I really needed to grow up and take matters in my own hands. And everything I've done ever since has been against what is conventional because I realized that this being real life, that any of this could happen, is actual, the real life. And it's not conventional. Real life isn't reality. The thing outside the bubble is never conventional. And the only way I knew to survive and, uh, and come out of that unscathed, or as unscathed as I could be, was to run towards the fire become as unconventional as possible, become chaos, uh, rather than trying to create all these contraptions to make my life as stable as possible, because that's also all bullshit. And rather than putting so much effort, a good analogy is the world is covered in shit and broken glass. Instead of me just running around trying to clean it up, trying to clean it up, all these special contraptions to make my world as clean as possible, free from broken glass and shit, I might as well just put on some good boots and just become one with the chaos and just walk around. Saves me a lot of effort, and I know that I'm resilient enough to handle anything. And you certainly have done that. Did you always see yourself going into the medical field? No. We can take, take a second. Uh, Calvin is uh, uh, having the best omelet in Mogadishu as we're sitting here talking. The, the, he has the best coffee and the best omelet, the famous Shamo Hotel, which means camel, apparently. <laughs> I guess... Maybe, I don't know. There, there might be some local ones that are better. There are a lot of local TikTokers, actually. Do you see these guys? With, they're kind of guys uh, all around sort of uh, beaches and parks with uh, DSLRs. And uh, I think, I think um, did you see those? Yeah. yeah. A lot of, a lot of Somali 
the art scene in Somalia has been very well known and regarded. And I mean, there were filmmakers in, next to him in the airplane. There was a, a YouTuber with a million followers who's, who wanted to ask about, you know, what my YouTube was or if I had Instagram. So the, the art savviness here is, uh, stands out among um, our travels in Horn of Africa. Uh, but that I always wanted to be a doctor. So my father and my mother as his lieutenant wanted me to become a doctor, and I did not. So after my dad died and my mom was sent off to stay with her parents and I had the space to think for myself, I actually dropped out of the pre-medical ambition and track. My dad died in the middle of college, so all the basic uh, requirements for pre-med was met, but at that time, uh, I wasn't sure if I needed to take the next step of applying to medical school. And after he died, I actually said, I don't need to. Well, you, you wrote about that you and your father would, had fought frequently about your future. Was that it was it, that uh, he wanted you to go into the medical field and you were hesitant to go in? Or what was that about exactly? Yeah, it, it, it's the, the short story, and we're going to delve more into it, it. It's not about what you do or become in your job. It's how you get there. And the reason why I love becoming or... The reason why I love being a doctor is because I did it my own way and it was how I got there rather than what I did. I did it for myself instead of for my father. And it was a whole journey of that of me saying no to becoming a doctor and then the inadvertent and indirect way that made me accidentally become a doctor after losing a few bets uh, is what brings me joy that going to work with with this gratitude. So many people out there hate what they do, hate their jobs, only do it for a certain purpose. And I challenge people to look into why did you get to where you are right now and what could you do instead of changing the what of it all, changing how you see something so that you can find more of a a gratitude in the stuff that you do so that you may go to work maybe doing the same thing but with a different frame of reference to appreciate better uh, your job so that you can actually find joy in what you do. And if not, and you can't do that, at least you made the effort to know that maybe the next step is something different. But I think the problem is that most people don't even take the first step of looking back and say, how did I get here? And not and instead of changing what, how can I change my perspective of where I am to love my work? And I think for me, I'm very uh, grateful to be lucky to have my story be so easy to understand on the, the how I became a doctor after I decided not to become a doctor is the reason why I love being a doctor every day of my job, even during, whether that's what sustained me during COVID. Okay, so in the book, um, you wrote about your first big international trip, which was Egypt in 2010. Um, you've since traveled to 190 countries. Um, what was it about that trip that made you want to see more of the world? I mean, I, I, you started traveling, I think, what, at 23? Mm-hmm. And I started traveling around 28. My first big trip was North Korea. And I mean, I'd been to Western Europe and stuff like that, but uh, sort of going to an unusual destination. Um, and it was one of those things where it's, uh, I was just always amazed uh, how at the sort of American uh, interest in traveling for a lot of people is kind of nil or non-existent. And, you know, for me, I always wanted to go to these places to show people that it's possible to do, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, you went there and whatever, and blah, blah, blah. I could never do that. Uh, I could never do it. And it's just like, no, the, the, the hardest part is actually just getting on the plane. And, you know, once you show up, actually, it's fine. You know, um, so I don't know. Was that similar to your experience? Absolutely. I, I think you hit it on the nail in how I describe what the purpose of the Mansu Diaries has been since it was a trial. Maybe you even said the hardest part of showing up. Did I just quote your book? I might, okay, so I, see, there we go. It's, so it stuck with me. I actually, I, so it's, that's a pretty generic quote that a lot of people use, but I do repeat half the battle, half the battle, half the battle. Letting the reader finish it is showing up. People know that. It's intrinsic in nature, but I think practicing that is another story. And the, the, the part of COVID was a vehicle to tell the overall theme of resilience and sometimes the hardest part is to get out of bed for a lot of people, and I get that. And you hit it on the nail when you say that you want to show that it's possible because that is what the Monsoon Diaries blog has been. And now that it's a 
a, an actual trade book that's published by a, by Harper uh, is I think the you know, why me like why uh, there are plenty of books out there by resilience because it it that's what reading a book is it's to fulfill, fulfill a felt need being told in a unique way in a vantage point and for me I'm grateful to be one of thousands and countless other authors who are way better writers than I am to come back to a very common theme is to show someone the reader out there that I've not yet met who walked a, walk, walks across a, my book in a library or Barnes and Noble and says I want to take uh, I want to know what he went through and to come down the final conclusion that unites all of us as human beings to, is to read someone else's story to know that it's possible for us I'm not in it to tell everyone this is how you're supposed to do it or you should do it or you you need to do this way or that way or this is the only way I just want to know I just want you to know that there is a possible way and this is one of those ways that can fit you and if it relates to you and you can feel that it shifts the needle a bit and getting you to where you want to go whether it's another country or getting you even your 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 uh, getting you out of the bed to even travel in the first place or to take that leap of faith and change your jobs or f- see, see your job in a different perspective or change anything in your life or overcome trauma or something that you're already going through then We've done our job. So let's talk more about that first trip to Egypt in 2010. Yeah, that was how I started becoming a doctor, actually. So when I lost the bet, which we'll talk about more (laughs) uh, and circle back to, that led me to the trip to Egypt, I did not want to be a doctor. I already had decided I'd rather maybe go into entertainment. I was making films at the time. Uh, I was dabbling in hosting this show on an MTVU. I, I'm reviewing music, music videos, so I was like, maybe I could do that. Or, I don't know, the world's my oyster. And my favorite job at, at, at college at the time was bartending. So I was definitely was already bartending and you know, making money off of, you know, working the odd job here and there. And I was getting to like DJing and club promoting. I was, I was like enjoying my freedom. That things that my, all the things that my parents did not want me to do, I was doing and loving it. And the decision not to go to medical school was my Oprah story, which was I was free from doing what my parents wanted me to do. And this is what true freedom is, and this is what, my, this is what happiness must feel like. But over the next two to three years after college, when I was doing all of this, I started wondering, what if I'm actually meant to become a doctor? What if I'm actually running away and trying to find joy in the rebellion this whole time? then actually deciding for myself, this is what I want to do. What if I'm going to be doing this, rebelling against my father for the rest of my life, not becoming a doctor, doing all these things? That means I'm still under the shadow of my, do- uh, of my father. I am still doing all this because of my father's influence. And how do I know where I begin versus my rebelling against my father begins? I need to be living my life irrespective, completely unrelated to anything my father has, uh, has over me and his influence. And that was really tough because you can never be completely divorced from your father. You know, everyone comes from a father and a mother uh, or two parents or guardians and you know, their influence on you will live, will live with you the rest of your life. But I was really worried that I was going to live a life of rebellion for the rest of my life and not living for myself. There's always the other, the bolder. The f- so how do I get to a, in, in a space where I can decide for myself because what if I decide to become a doctor and, I, and realize, oh man, I did it because I felt guilty. But luckily, or well, unluckily at this point, uh, I had a terrible college uh, transcript after my dad died. I, like, my grades plummeted, I stopped caring, my MCAT score wasn't, I didn't retake my MCAT when I should have. So I decided to uh, try to, try to I, I, just, I just decided that I'm not, I'm not gonna get in with that scores and if I really wanna go to med school, I need to retake everything. But then what, the effort to do that, I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't, what if I'm just going to commit a path I don't want to? It was the Egypt story, the, the, my trip to Egypt, tri- because that's how travel solved this for me. And I wasn't even conscious at the time that it was. It was just a, a pattern behavior that led me to the next step. I was bartending, thinking about all this, met a girl. She liked me enough to make a bet with me. In our, you know, we were drinking together at the bar. And then 36, ou- 36 hours later, find myself in Egypt. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> What's your name? Like, with her. Uh, and 
we only spent like a two to three days together because before like a big snowstorm happened or she was with her parents and they had to leave early. And then I was also supposed to go with two other friends who also couldn't stay as long as they wanted to. So I had thought I was going to have three weeks with people in Egypt, but ended up spending most of those three weeks alone. And this was back in the winter of 2010. And I ended up hating it for the first week after they left. It's like, man, this travel thing is really stressful. I'm alone. I didn't bring anything. I didn't prepare anything. I'm going to die. 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 The second week, I was still alive. I was still like getting by and I was trying to figure out how to get to one place to another. And I'm like, oh, I'm still here. And it wasn't until the third week when I came back and I was like, wow, I, I can handle this. And the best thing about that was, the, it was that realizing that was the only time in my life where I was truly alone. Nobody was there to help me and take care of me like a parent or a friend. Uh, I had to rely, and that's not true. The only people that could, uh, there, were no, there was nobody else I knew personally that could take care of me like a parent or a friend. I had to rely on the kindness of strangers and myself. When it came to conversations, there was no one I could commune with. I could not talk to anyone. So the only person I could have conversations with in English was myself. And sometimes the occasional kindness of strangers. And coming back from that, it's, it's more or less a, a, a less extreme version of a Vipassana retreat. You come back knowing yourself better because you went through an experience only relying on yourself. I went to Egypt with the expectations that I would be with friends, one of them who was Egyptian to take care of me, uh, and another person who was more well-traveled to show me the ropes. But having them actually leave me alone in Egypt for three weeks and having the opportunity to spend three weeks only relying on myself and the kindness of strangers allowed me to come back and look in the mirror and say, wow, that was the only space that you had to know that you could do this alone without thinking that you needed to rely on anyone that you knew personally. And it, the kindness of strangers gave me faith in humanity to make me say, you know, I do want to be part of this world and not be a rebel the rest of my life and help this wonderful world the best way I can. And uh, number two, why can't I be that stranger to be kind to others? Because they showed that to me. They didn't have to. It was the winter of 2010, not a very easy time to me, an Egyptian in Egypt at the time. Uh, and then number three, I, it was me. It was not like my friends talked to them. I was there. I was, I was the common denominator and the solo traveler to receive all this kindness and to take care of myself. Then I came back a little closer to becoming my own best friend. And it was that experience that made me realize, wow, I went to this trip not wanting to travel. It was for a girl. I didn't even want to travel at the time. And I ended up coming back three weeks later realizing I love this thing called traveling. Why did it take three weeks for me to be dragged kicking and screaming to embrace a concept that most people are born loving, to travel? Then how do I know that I'm going to feel the same way of becoming a doctor? I was dragged kicking and screaming to become a doctor, then finally had the, the, the space to say no to it. But what if I'm actually meant to love being a doctor in medicine in the same way I'm supposed to love traveling? And because of the, the, the bet wager uh, uh, origin story for this Egypt story, so just like the wager that led me to Egypt, I needed to put myself in a similar challenge to help me decide whether I'm meant to become a doctor. And that was, instead of retaking any classes or the MCATs, I was just going to apply. I decided to apply to every single medical school that I would be willing to go to, 26 of them, with my shitty grades and my below average MCAT score. And hopefully from that kind of wager, if I get rejected everywhere and it's not meant to be, I could check that box off, have my Oprah story and say, I tried to go to med school, I got rejected everywhere, and now I'm going to be a traveler or something. I don't know, a writer. I, I, I did that. I just, I, well, now you are both, <laughs> a traveler and writer and, I get, and doctor, all three. And I feel, it's weird to hear that, but I feel that that approach of just being open-minded and taking bets on yourself gives you the answer that you never thought was possible, which is not A or B, but the all of the above. And in fact, it's the all of the above is what kept each other going. I ended up getting to one school who loved my story and said, there's so many med students are here. 
because they're as pre meds. They always say, "I know what I want. I want to be a doctor. It's a calling. It's a calling." And it was just so repetitive. And yours is the only one that was honest enough to say, "I'm not sure, but I'm giving it a shot anyway because there's something out there." And they were like, "That's a genuine, true calling." It's like it's like someone says, "I have no insecurities." You have or it's someone that has a lot of insecurities. Oh, I know this is a calling. It, it, you're probably trying to convince yourself. Do you want the one, or do you actually want it? And a rich person never has to say they're rich. For me to actually embody that and tell the school, I'm taking a chance by saying I'm not sure, but something is pulling me to apply anyway. You know better. You've accepted many, many doctors in the, since medicine was born, as a, like one of the oldest medical schools in in uh, New York. If you believe in me, then I'll go. I'll go off of that. You know better than I would. And they took me in. And I decided to do both and keep both. And the irony is that it was travel that kept me in medical school, even though it was the thing that distracted me from it. It was the thing that kept me sustaining through med school because it was recharging me mentally, physically. Not sorry. Medical school was recharging me mentally, maybe not physically, so that I can go back wanting to uh, wanting to continue in med school. And med school was the thing that was lighting a fire under my ass to wanting to keep traveling because I knew if I stopped traveling, I probably would quit med school and burn out. And they, had, they actually kept each other afloat to lead me to where I am today and realize they, they could not exist without each other. That's great. And that's a great summation of um, how these things tie together. And so I'm actually going to ask very specifically now about sort of the, the moment that, uh, I mean, obviously traveling as a doctor, there's always going to be moments that your field crosses with traveling. But, you know, as you wrote about in the book, things really came to a head in 2020 when you were in Angola and you were getting the news that the, of the COVID-19 pandemic emerging. And you were unsure of what to expect when you got home, what, what things were going to look like. I think things ended up uh, being much worse than, than you could have imagined. So, you know, as someone who doesn't work in the medical field, you know, we saw these headlines about the lack of PPE and supplies and space in hospitals. Um, but your book contains an almost day-by-day diary of just what exactly medical professionals in New York City went through at that time. So the obvious conclusion uh, is that the U.S. medical system was ill-prepared for such an emergency. But what do you want readers to ultimately take away from sharing your experience of, uh, of working in the ERs, in various ERs in New York, because you're a per diem doctor. So you had the, you have the perspective of working uh, in hospitals, I think, across the five boroughs, or at least four of them? Four of them. Were you, in, you weren't in Staten Island? No. Okay, crossing so, okay. A ferry okay. For a COVID yeah. shift crossing a ferry for a COVID shift from Manhattan would not be a great idea. Okay, so four of the five boroughs. So what, what do you ultimately want readers to take away from, from that experience and that aspect of the book? I want readers to remember that something like this actually happened. That when it comes to difficult times in our lives, the way to heal properly isn't to magically forget about it. It will stay with you for the rest of your lives. In fact, I would want to challenge readers to turn around and instead of looking at this monstrous thing that was a pandemic and trying to make it go away or disappear or running away from it, but rather lean in and see it as more of an opportunity to help them reframe the rest of their lives moving forward with a different perspective of resilience and growth. And that you know that it is the difficult thing that makes us more capable of handling the, all the other chaos that's going to come for the rest of our lives. It is the difficult thing that becomes the friend by yourself. Well, the things that you learn from the difficult thing, at the least. Um, you can't be friends with everyone, but at least you can be friends with the, the meaning behind a former friendship or relationship or the meaning behind what you learn from a difficult experience with somebody or something or an event. So when tragedy occurs in your life and you know, for some, a lot of people it hasn't happened yet and I don't wish trauma or tragedy on anyone, but we all know that in the long enough timeline, tragedy, trauma, difficult experiences is inevitable. And I think we live in a society right now where it becomes more of a, a, a knee-jerk reaction to run away from it or try to suppress it because it's a safe thing to do 
And while that may work temporarily, it would always come to a head at the most inconvenient of times when, it, when you, it's a game time decision, when you least want it to happen. And rather than letting that happen, I would rather spend most of my energy or, and bandwidth if I have it, once I have the space, well, maybe it's a temporary fix, but once I have that space to confront it, to confront the difficult thing, to face it head on, to not be scared, to actually develop a habit of anything that scares me, I run towards it for m even more. I try to embrace it because the least that the worst thing that can happen is that I walk out of it saying maybe I didn't fix the situation, but at least I've become a more resilient person and know that I can handle it, that I can do this, so that the next time this happens again, maybe there's an opportunity for me to be better or uh, to say it in a different way or to tackle in a different way. But the, the hard part, which is what you said in the beginning of this podcast, can I even get out of bed to do it? Is it possible? I can, the, the practice of constantly running towards the fires to make comfortable what is uncomfortable, to embrace your tragedies and traumas in the past rather than looking away and seeing them as a, a friend or an opportunity to reframe everything for the rest of your life and uh, tackle challenges in the future with a different mindset and more resilience. All that comes down to, can I even do it in the first place? And if you make a practice of constantly doing it, it only adds to your, your belief. It only confirms your resolve that the next time something difficult comes your way in your life, you can go in not having to think, can I do it, can I do it, can I do it? You're actually now more, like, uh, more or less probably thinking, I've done this before. It's gonna be hard. But I know hard now. I know hard a little better because I've done this before. Fuck it. That's not, that's not even a concern. That, that, that's, I don't even think about whether I can do this. I need to think about how I can tackle this. And the next thing becomes a habit of, you know, you don't have to think at all. You just do it. And then that's when, when COVID came around after a habit of, or a lifetime of a habit of always running towards the fire as an emergency room doctor or as uh, all, all the tr trauma I do in my job and you know, all the trauma I grew up with with my parents and all the travels that I put myself through during medical school. By the time COVID came around, it was, I mean, not the adventure I signed up for, but the way my brain managed it was to treat it as an uncharted adventure that I needed to tackle without having to think about it. Because once you hesitate, that's when the virus gets you. That's the way I had to think about it. I needed to just go in and let all the things that I learned and habit-wise of dealing with, you know, with, with, with difficult situations, which is shoot first and <laughs> ask questions later, is what I think kept me alive during uh, a time like COVID. And that's certainly uh, reflected in the writing style of the book. It's an informative and uh, inspiring and a very quick read, I must say. You know, it's one of those, I'm just going to be totally frank, you know, you have a friend that publishes a book, uh, and I had that myself uh, with my own book, and people that you feel, you know, read it because um, uh, they feel obligated to or whatever. Then I picked it up and uh, pretty much blew through it pretty quickly. Uh, you know, it was a very quick read. Uh, and I, again, I think it's uh, attributed to uh, the writing style of the inner monologue. And then, of course, uh, you know, weaving what appears to be on the surface two very different things, these travelogues, and then also your experience as an ER doctor. But in fact, um, they go very well together. And it makes for a compelling read. This was an interview with Dr. Calvin Sun, travel partner with YPT, author of The Monsoon Diaries, A Doctor's Journey of Hope and Healing from the ER Frontlines, the Far Reaches of the World. Uh, it's available now from Harper Horizon. Pick up your copy. You won't regret it. Bring it on a tour with that Calvin's on. Have him sign it. He is modest, but he does like that. And uh, any, any closing words before we uh, go on our separate ways here and depart Mogadishu? You know, it's remarkable that I came here uh, to this podcast and we talked about my book. We didn't talk about Mogadishu in Somalia, and that's what I thought we were going to do. Uh, so it speaks to, I think, the, the friendship that we have developed from traveling together that we realize it's not so much the destination, but rather what we've been through already. I mean, Mogadishu is one of my new favorite travel cities that I've experienced. I never felt unsafe. I, I'm very grateful for all the work and the, 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 the behind the scenes efforts that were done to keep me feeling totally safe at this time. I, 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 I do acknowledge that, but I think also the energy of being in a place like Mogadishu, Somalia is what reaffirms 
uh, why I travel and uh, also to meet the people that are also willing to take a risk with me to come to a place in Mogadishu and also feeling similarly safe is uh, I think the, the context and background um, the, the background circumstances that can breed, breed friendships in a very unique way that we don't really get at home and then when we have a, a space to talk about travels and the, 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 the space that we have together, me, you and me and Justin, we didn't talk about the, the destination at all. We talked about celebrating each other's accomplishments and being grateful for having each other in our lives and supporting each other all, these, all this time and the irony of only seeing each other, even though we live in the same city, but only seeing each other when we're traveling, uh, it gives you that, 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 that joy in knowing that life doesn't have to be one way. And then there are many different ways to live a life. And if it fits two different people who are willing to yeah, share space, be vulnerable, open up, and uh, be happy for one another, and have the, the, the perceived goal, which is traveling to a place, be the background to nurture such a friendship. And I think we, that means we, I think we've accomplished the whole true goal of what travel is supposed to be about. It's not about trying to get to a place or tick off as many countries or I have to do this. It's about enjoying and being present in every waking moment. And, and being present isn't the fact that I'm in a country. It's the fact that I'm with good people to share this experience with and develop a friendship from sharing that without even having to say it out loud. But I'm going to say it out loud right now because it's good to be, to be, to be grateful, to channel gratitude and realize that, uh, that, that it's the people next to you that make a journey possible and ha that happiness is best shared. So for those of you who are listening out there, whether, it's, whether you wanna read my book or travel with me or travel with YPT, just know it all boils down to, there are just things in life that may challenge you like COVID or a pandemic or even a travel experience or even a personal loss, like a loss of a loved one that will challenge you, but they're there not necessarily to, to end anything, but rather give you hope that uh, new things may arise from that, that there more should be reframed as opportunities for you to take hold and see where can my life lead in the next direction and who I can meet to take me on that journey and who I can share that, that journey with that, that makes me want to live life with renewed purpose and resilience. Very well said. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to be here on the Pioneer Podcast. And uh, next time uh, we catch up or next time we're on a tour together, maybe we will do a podcast specifically about the destination or maybe you'll have another book out and we'll talk about that. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Justin. I'll see you at the next Tier 1 destination. And that was my interview with Dr. Calvin Sun about his book, Monsoon Diaries, A Doctor's Journey of Hope and Healing from the ER Front Lines to the Far Reaches and More. As I said, it's a quick and fascinating read. Do yourself a favor and pick up a copy. You can order it right on Amazon, or if you've got a brick and mortar store, uh, Barnes & Noble still operating near you, you can pick it up there as well. Now for some quick hits on some really incredible tours that I would like to highlight for our listeners. YPT are proud to introduce our ultimate Southeast Asia tour running July 15th through 26th. Experience Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam with a 12-day packed itinerary exploring these countries the YPT way. Starting in Bangkok, this epic tour runs through Cambodia to Siem Reap to Phnom Penh, visiting historical sites ranging from Angkor Wat to those related to the dark history of the Khmer Rouge, and then finishes in Vietnam, where you'll travel by train from Saigon and finish with a bang in the capital city of Hanoi. This is no doubt the most affordable way to experience the most of what Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam have to offer, accompanied by one of our expert guides. Next, also consisting of a trifecta of countries, but on the other side of the world, we have our Soviet Baltics tour running August 21st to 28th. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are popular destinations, but YPT has a custom itinerary which explores the region's Soviet past, visiting Lithuania's Soviet-era monuments to Stalin and Lenin near the Belarusian border, and in YPT style, we'll also visit its self-declared micronation of Uzupis. In Latvia, we'll take you deep into the leftover of its Soviet infrastructure, including abandoned secret cities, radio communication installations, and missile bunkers, places even most locals never even have the opportunity to visit. The Soviet Baltics tour will conclude in Estonia, where you will visit the lesser-known towns including Narva on the Russian border, a 
secret city with Stalinist architecture, which feels more like being in Russia than in the EU. Check it out and experience the Baltics as only you can with YPT. Sticking with remnants of the former Soviet Union and running concurrently to Soviet Baltics from August 23rd to 28th is YPT's Svalbard Soviet Frontier, Pyramiden, and Barentsburg Arctic Ghost Towns. Sound fascinating? It is. Our custom itinerary around Svalbard visits Russian settlements and coal mining ghost towns in the world's northernmost regions. Starting in the world's most northern settlement of Long Yerbin, only 1,000 kilometers from the North Pole, you will then cruise to the sparsely inhabited former Russian mining settlements of Grumont and Barentsburg. After, you'll cruise on and enjoy the breathtaking views of the tundra, glaciers, and hopefully do some whale watching in the Greenland Sea before landing in Pyramiden. A highlight of the tour, the abandoned Soviet settlement still preserved with the Soviet-style architecture and a monument to Lenin. Formerly home to 1,000 inhabitants, you'll explore the kindergarten, school, public swimming pool, football field, and coal mine all left over when the settlement was abandoned in 1999. Very few tourists have ever traveled to Pyramid Inn, let alone spend two days doing some serious urban X of this most fascinating and forsaken Soviet hamlet. YPT's Svalbard tour connects seamlessly with our Arctic adventure Spitsbergen and Northeast Greenland cruise taking place immediately after. And last on my highlight section is our Hidden Iran tour running October 30th to November 6th. We have designed an itinerary which takes our travelers to a different side of Iran, hitting both the must-see sites as well as hidden, lesser travel locations. Starting in Tehran, you'll visit the mausoleum of Ayatollah Khomeini and the Revolutionary Martyrs Cemetery, the former U.S. Embassy and the Azadi Tower. Next, it's off to Isfahan, exploring royal palaces, mosques, bazaars, and a gym to watch ancient Persian Persian workouts. In Yazd, take in the ancient Zoroastrian temples, Towers of Silence, and the UNESCO site of Persepolis outside of Shiraz. Amazing food, friendly locals, and Iran's road less traveled await you. This is a tour for true pioneers and links to our Iraqi Kurdistan and Iraq combo tours. So why do I highlight these tours on the podcast? I do this because as a trailblazing company which specializes in taking travelers to the world's hardest to reach places, we are never content resting on the laurels of our most popular and and evergreen tours. And our team works hard to continue to develop brand new itineraries to places that our travelers may never have heard of or considered before. And the tours that I've just highlighted, I think showcase the cutting edge work of our staff. Check them out. Okay, remember, in 1888, Nellie Bly set out to accomplish the fictional record from Jules Verne's novel Around the World in 80 Days, and actually broke the fictional record and completed her journey around the world in 72 days, independently, by ship, train, and overland means of transportation. So, you know what I'm going to say, because I always say it. Don't just sit at home and listen to me talk about traveling the world. Head over to youngpioneertours.com, sign up for a tour, establish your own travel goals, whether they be to visit every country, see every natural wonder are something completely unique and personal to you and be the next nelly bly that's it for the young pioneer podcast season two stay tuned for season three coming to you in july and starting with an engaging episode on country collecting and which country and territory lists our staff and customers follow and why i'm justin martell and this has been another season and another episode of the young pioneer podcast Oh, 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 oh.